seat. <clears throat> <laughs> you folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists in our food supply or medications and sometimes even in the air you breathe be totally overlooked as the cause of disease in America? Watch me now and soon you too will know the cause. Welcome. Thank you for joining in. I am so thankful to you, this wonderful audience, for uh, forwarding my blogs. Uh, I really didn't anticipate this. I, I really didn't. But I guess when you've studied one thing, I can't change the oil on my car. I can't mow my lawn. You know, I'm worried. But I can study fungus and try and help people with their health problems. The other day, Tuesday, and thank you for all of those of you who forwarded this, by your forwarding to other people, <clears throat> I am just getting the most amazing people dropping in uh, and I like when people challenge me cerebrally. I like that. I like when people come in. Had a guy drop in. He said, germs don't cause disease uh, the other day. And if you eat watermelon and blackstrap molasses, which is highly uh, nutritional, by the way, blackstrap molasses, uh, you'll get rid of your health problems. And I, I just dropped in and said, OK, please, come in. Your opinion is welcome, but uh, be careful. You know, I, I don't want this audience uh, 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 misunderstanding fungus. Boy, if there's one food that really fungus loves, it's got to be watermelon with all the, the sugar and sweet in it and so forth. I appreciate people like him who come in and give their opinion. I don't like the hit and runners. Throw the F-bomb at you, they're gone. You're crazy. And I can I see because my wife will get on these conspiracy you know websites and move around and then she'll send it to our kids and our kids, probably a lot of you are sending what I'm saying. You know the elephant in the room the other day. I said the University of Washington, or Georgetown University, I believe it was, uh, stated 36 months ago right now that nitric oxide uh, flushed fungus on the skin. Just got rid of it. Nitric oxide got rid of fungus on the skin. Um, previous to nitric oxide, they had to use deep systemic mycotic drugs, antifungal drugs, right? So this was a breakthrough. 36 months later, the same university, maybe the same people, said, oh, by the way, nitric oxide zaps uh, this, uh, this SARS-type virus. Hmm. Antifungal, anti-COVID. Do you see where I'm going? Because I'm the guy that hypothesized six months ago that bat caves, Wuhan, China, these are virologists. They don't know fungus. They go into a bat cave with poop all over in the dirt, and they shuffle over there and take bat guano. They're exposed to all this, the lining of the intestine, and therefore the poop, uh, or the feces, I'll call it, in bats and other birds has a fungus to break it down. It's called histoplasma capsulatum. And it initiates a disease in the immunocompromised. Maybe. Maybe in the immunocompetent, too. Good immune systems. It initiates a disease called histoplasmosis. I have hypothesized that in they shuffle, stirring up that stuff, and they were in garbs and, you know, all this gloves and so forth. Then they got in a car after they left the bat cave, and they fired up that little car, and they drove back to the Wuhan virology lab, where they took the bat guano containing, they think, SARS, because bats are predisposed to, you know, SARS uh, viruses, but it also had something else in it, didn't it? By nature of the fact those bats have feces all over that dark, damp cave, it had histoplasma. Histoplasma fungi have DNA in them, right? And viri are either DNA or RNA. Messenger RNA is a whole other thing, and we'll, I'll do a whole show on that sometime and teach you a little bit about that. Does genetic fusion take place? They got in their car, drove back, were so excited with their little vials, and they opened the laboratory and poof! You know, they pulled their booties off and their hats and their, their uh, coats and so forth, gloves, and boom, 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 all that histoplasma just took off. Folks, it does this. I mean, fungi are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're on my eyelashes right now. 
okay? A strong immune system, that 20 minute workout today bought me some time, right? I may have a year or two left, which is really cool. I hope to teach you guys this. <clears throat> Those two, I believe, nucleic acids, ribo and deoxyribo, liked each other. Cute fungus, good looking virus. Hey, let's have hybrids. And so they did. This would behave, this hybrid, this is published, folks. Genetic fusion is well documented. Um, this would create something that, histoplasmosis isn't transmittable, right? So this would enable histo to be transmittable. Well, your spit goes six feet, or eight feet, or what did we find out, 85 feet? <clears throat> your sneeze goes 20 feet or something like that. So now that droplet, that 50%, I hypothesize, 50% of virus containing 50% histoplasma is now virulent. And so, and it wouldn't behave. You'd put these people on resdemivir or whatever that drug is called or, or any number of antivirals, Zovrax. You put these people on antivirals and they should get better, but they're not. And, and so... I just believe what we're dealing with here, and thank you, Connie, and thank you, all of you, for uh, publishing that they have now found in some COVID deaths. They do, uh, uh, you know, during the autopsies, they draw blood and study all these things. They do uh, studies looking for fungus, and sure enough, aspergillus mold is growing inside some of these deceased people. That one doesn't fit for me because on their shoes and their clothing, they would have had histoplasma, which nobody knows about. You're gonna have to find a PhD uh, mycologist. Mycologists are these really, really bright people who don't have MD degrees, so they can't practice medicine, right? They get a PhD degree and they study fungi. And they're, they're like me, they're a little weird. You know, they just get into fungus and they're totally entrenched with fungus but they can't practice medicine. They can't do what these doctors let me do <clears throat> in clinical nutrition. All of these 40, 45 year doctors who brought me in and said, I'm losing patients, help me keep them. What's the cause of their ringing in their ear? What's the cause of their pain? What's the cause of their psoriasis? Maybe putting them on my diet and trying antifungals would be successful. I'll do it. I just, I'm losing patients. They come and see me one time. I put them naked in a PUVA box, UV light, for their psoriasis. I give them a shot of cortisone in the hip. I never see them again. That's because, Doc, they've been to six other dermatologists who did the same darn thing. Nothing new. Here's another guy, $800 bill. You read the opening to the women's book. You've been through this before. 600 bucks, no, I'm not gonna give you antifungals. This isn't a fungal problem, this is a skin problem, okay? So understand that I think this whole COVID thing is 50% behaving like a virus and 50% behaving like a fungus. Well, Doug, if you were right, they'd each have equal incubation periods. Histoplasma capsulatum just happens to be two to 17 days incubation. Oh, by the by, COVID-19 just happens to be two to 17 day incubation period before you become sick with it, okay? But Doug, then it would have to behave 50% like a fungus. Let's use cinchona bark. Let's use bark on a tree, antifungal fungostatic. It stops fungus. Um, <clears throat> And if you don't like the person promoting this cinchona bark or this hydroxychloroquine, then you condemn it. You shove it under the carpet quickly. Well, he, what does he know about science? We're scientists. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? So out come the condemners. Two of the biggest medical journals put their reputation on the line, not for doctors, but for Doug Kaufman. They lost. I'd never pick up one of them again. Okay? They published mistruths and had to retract that hydroxychloroquine was killing people. That's how political this disease has gotten. Do you think the way I do? I had, what was her name, beautiful name, uh, the other night from Chile. You may have seen her in the questions. She said to me, Doug, we, uh, this was amazing. I agree people have died. Every death is sad. <clears throat> I'm not so sure these were COVID-19 deaths. Can I just go down that road? 
you heard thir or Tuesday about the young 20-something man who got in a motorcycle wreck and died of COVID-19. And you and I are going, what in the world is happening? So I get a call from a friend of mine in Los Angeles. This is yesterday. His girlfriend, this is a son of a dear friend of mine. His girlfriend is COVID positive. Now, a lot of you folks are wanting to know, Doug, if I am COVID positive, what does that mean? My first thought, let me tell you a doctor's first thought. Uh, you're gonna be quarantined. We're gonna be testing you on a regular basis. We want you on resdemivir or remsdevazivir or whatever that's called. Um, we're gonna take care of you, don't worry. You may have to go to the hospital if you have other uh, comorbidities, if you have other uh, illnesses, diabetes being one of them. I don't hear that. First thing when, when uh, he calls me and he said, uh, my girlfriend is positive for COVID, my first thought, would it be yours? Really? How accurate are these tests? Just, just Doug Kaufman here, I'm not a doctor. But that wasn't why he called me. He said, my friend wanted you to know this. She waited in line for two hours and she left. She had to go to work. She couldn't take the test. But they notified her three days later she was positive. So I did a little homework and I'd like to share some of that with you. <clears throat> oh, I've got a good show lined up for you here. Uh, I should have had it out in front. Of course I don't, so I'll have to do a little digging. Here it is. <clears throat> this was ABC News, Sarasota, Florida. Just an article I printed. Three days ago, it says. Coronavirus continues to spread quickly across the state of Florida, plus now on the Sun Coast. Although testing has been made much more available, some say there are problems in really getting a handle on how much the virus is in our community. It has nothing to do with being able to get the test, but instead get the results. The quickest turnaround is about 48 hours. The majority of time it takes about a week in finding out if you're infected or not. However, the most recent issue is getting back test results that aren't even yours. I got a call asking me and they told me I had tested, uh, I got a call asking for me and they told me that I was positive, said this person. I'm not going to tell you her name. Uh, positive for what, she said. Positive for COVID-19. I said that's impossible I never got tested. Uh, this individual then had to go through, had gone through a drive-in testing site in Manatee Rural Health, but before she was able to get swabbed, she left realizing it was for people who were symptomatic only. I told them they needed to take this off my record, and they said I had to prove to them that I wasn't positive. She uh, tested negative just two days later. Okay, so that's why my friend's son called me. She wasn't tested. I just wanted to report that to you, Doug. She wasn't tested. Um, do I think something nefarious is going on? Let me tell you, the doctor, I, I read this, I got online and read some other news uh, uh, research on this. So a doctor who oversaw this, Wolfson, I think his name is, said this girl was 17th in line, she signed in, and when we got the test back, number 17 was positive. We didn't know she had left. Wow, if my accountant kept records like that, I would have money. I mean, it's really fascinating how disheveled this whole thing is, folks. I don't think, I've got to tell you my testimony six months ago, or my, my declaration six months ago. We are going to learn that when it comes to germs, we don't know much. I'm the guy 50 years ago that found that there's a fungal component to cancer, and I know that's why you came here today. Many of you are concerned about a loved one with cancer, so I'm going to jump off from there point I want to make is, for reasons we don't understand, we are hyper-diagnosing COVID. I think it was 2017, 2018, I looked online, 61,000 people died of the flu. We're currently at about 150,000, and that was in the U.S. 
where currently 90,000 more have passed of COVID or have they? And I really, folks, there's, you can go deep with this. Why would they want to kill us? Why would they want to implant? I, I've heard stories that I, I hope aren't true. Why would they want to mandate and then implant a chip in us? Okay? I don't know. I've heard stories that say there are going to be towers that uh, through frequencies can alter your thinking if you have that chip on board. I'm telling you, I could become so paranoid or I could know because I've been in this field for 50 years. I'm an old guy. That things aren't okay in medicine. We've got the leader of the gang telling us not to wear a mask. We've got the leader of the gang two weeks later saying, yeah, okay, wear a mask. We've got the leader of the gang publishing a couple of years ago, hydroxychloroquine was the bang. It really works for viruses. Then two years later saying it doesn't work. I think, folks, it's your and my fault, it's my fault for looking at the medical community as deity. There's some very smart people, and I have, I'm not ashamed at all to tell you twice my IQ, right? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, but they're rule followers. I went through, I don't know how many, eight, eight week boot camp, and they took a rugged bad guy like me and hundreds of other 18 year old kids and they made a stand at attention and they had a big drill sergeant come out and scream in our faces and threaten us and so forth and I got to tell you eight weeks is what eight times seven 56 days later we're men no hair we're listening to what it's just like putting masks on right psychologically we train we call that resocialization okay Medical school isn't eight weeks. Medical school is four long, hard years of re-social, ah, yeah, you learn about physiology and microbiology and you learn about drugs, you know, pharmacology, but you're a different person. When you went in at 22, by 26, you're a different person. You don't ask what the cause of cancer is. Hush, don't you dare ask what the cause of diabetes is. We already told you we don't know. We treat, oh, we can't use that word. We will manage your disease from womb to tomb. Oh, it's gonna cost you 600 a month with your medications. How do you take these people with twice my IQ and in four years have them so re-socialized, nobody asks what non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that lump on the neck is. Can I just tell you something? If they had this book, 20 bucks, let me just read it. This is the Fungal Bionic Series written by those three doctors at the World Health. I was so proud of the World Health Organization when I got this book from these doctors. I befriended one of them. His name is Dr. Costantini, and he signed my books, and he and I had so much fun. But at any rate, I digress. Are penicillin and other antibiotics carcinogenic? Wait a second, page 43. These are doctors. Does penicillin cause cancer? Certainly physicians would not believe such a risk exists for penicillin, antibody given to billions of humans. However, it is by definition a fungal poison, a mycotoxin, and mycotoxins cause cancer. Theta complete. Now let me, let me just read this. Penicillin and other antibiotics cause lymphoma in humans. Any of you suffering with lymphoma? I need you to hear this. The year was 1992. I have not found one doctor in my career, which spans 50 years, that knows this. Doctors Bernstein and Ross in their study of prior medication youth and a health history as risk factors for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma found that greater than or equal to two months of treatment with penicillin or other antibiotics were associated with a significantly increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You mean the pills you told us to write prescriptions for all day? You never told us they cause cancer? Well, that was somebody else's fault. 
I got to tell you folks, all isn't okay in the halls of science. As I, as I text and I blog to you guys, these are really good people who I believe were changed. In boot camp, we were brainwashed. You get up at 5 a.m., you shine your shoes, you fold your underwear like I've never folded it again like that in my life. Uh, and here's what you do, but you don't talk or you will be slapped. Medical school, don't you dare ask what the cause of female cysts are. Don't you dare. You just treat them. For how long? Don't ask that either. I don't know why. But I think what we're dealing with, if we can discount those towers and we can discount all of these um, drugs and, and we just forgive them, <laughs> that's what they were taught to do. And you're honoring that. When you go to a doctor or seven or 55 doctor's offices, you're honoring that. Now, having said that, I have found my way out. This wasn't easy. I have studied the thickest books you can ever imagine, and I'm a puzzle putter together. And so now we're going to, don't, don't stop taking medicines. I think many of you could, with your doctor's help, you never stop. Drug companies are brilliant. The easy part's selling you on them. The dangerous part is getting you off them. Your physiology is blocked or inhibited. They've, they've worked their job in your body. You don't just stop taking an antidepressant. Okay, if I was on antidepressants and I was suffering from thoughts, I would begin exercising every day. I would, begin, I would change my diet tonight. I think many, if not most people would get better. If I was in pain, same thing, okay? All, this is a guy named um, Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, a German a philosopher, 17th, 18th century. He was the guy that once said, once you're, uh, once you're over the hill, you tend to increase speed. And I have always loved that. I've used it in some of my writings. So you get up here to 60, 70 years old, and then you really go fast. 80, boom. He said this one time, and I love this. I opened a doctor's lecture with this, trying to calm the savage beast before I went on and said fungus is everything. All truth passes through three distinct stages. First, it's ridicu ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as self-evident. Did you guys know Robert Adkins? I, uh, I had an office in New York. I really liked him. Um, and we'd go, he had a favorite little place we'd go eat breakfast when I went out to New York. I lived in LA. And uh, uh, they knew, they, he didn't have to order anything. You know, I, back then, I was probably, this is in the 80s, 70s, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'd get a bowl of oatmeal or something like that. He didn't have to order. They brought him bacon and eggs. And I said, don't you want a piece of toast? Oh, no, don't eat toast. Um, the Adkins diet, Robert went through this. All truth passes through three stages. I watched him in his lifetime. He slipped, hit his head on ice on the sidewalk, and died some years ago. Neat man. You guys would have loved him. First, it's ridiculed. That poor man was beat up by lawyers because he didn't think grain was okay. He thought avocados were okay. Now, you've got to remember, this is back in my time. When those dietitians looked at me eating an avocado and they said, you're going to eat that? Your arteries are, go I mean, folks, full cycle. Which science will you have me believe, said Charles Spurgeon. The science of 50 years ago, the science of 2020 with COVID, or the science of 2070? I'm with the science of 2070. He was ridiculed. Then he was violently opposed, and he was sued many times. Finally, folks, I remember a couple years after he died, I was on the internet, and there, uh, there were reports from medical, uh, not medical schools, medical articles that were saying, yeah, you know, this, uh, this lower uh, carbohydrate, higher protein diet might really be something. Get his name off it. 
let's call it ours, now that we know it works, and we violently opposed him. I've been through that. I've lived through this. Uh, when I die, you guys go with me. You guys will still be here. You know, When I die, um, you're going to see fungus just popping up everywhere. Oh, Kaufman can't get the credit. Here's the cool thing. I live a blessed life. I don't need the credit. Okay? All I want before I leave is you to know this. You don't have to follow it. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about fungus. Two things I want you to know. Fungi manipulate their environment. Kind of sounds like COVID. Fungi manipulate their environment. Clinical Mycology, that book I always reference for you back there, fungi alter the human immune system in favor of its own survival. It'll mess with you until it gets to go home, six foot in the soil. Fungi alter the reproduction of the catchfly plant. This was Dr. Doug Gill, University of Maryland. So imagine, instead of making pollen, it's impregnated with fungus now. Fungi alter the behavior of the host. You need antidepressants. You're acting out. Your behavior is atypical. You need antidepressants. Fungi can get in the brain. Here's the mouth, here's the nose. That's the way we get fungus, except for scratches on the skin and so forth. Here's the brain. Fungi alter the pH of mediums they grow in. Wow, wow. I've got that big graph in there. You remember the properties of all the mycotoxins if you want. Ooh, that's a good one, John. Wow. So they really want to talk, and I'll honor that. Um, Okay, good. I got another hour. You know, it'd be fun. I wish I could, uh, I know you couldn't do it, but to me, this is so enlightening over television because television, I just come out, you've seen me, I spew, and I interview some guests, and then I'm done. And I never get the feedback I get from you guys, uh, you know, on, on Facebook and YouTube and so forth. Fungi alter the pH of mediums they grow. Well, you're very acid. We know disease, cancer, grows in an acid environment. So drink this water. It's alkaline water. Why am I so acid? We don't know. Just drink this water. Folks, gut fungi can make you very acid. Well, how do I get rid of that? We talk about that here. I got a brand new one for you. Folic acid, right? The synthetic folate, vitamin B9. Amazing. When you and I were little, we used to get cereals that said fortified with vitamins. Neither the cereal industry nor the scientists have ever gotten it. I had to put one and one together. Corn and rice and wheat are impregnated with mycotoxins that can induce um, damage to an unborn child. Okay, We began to realize in 1998 we let uh, OBGYNs tell their uh, patients when they're pregnant to double the dose from 200 micrograms to 400 micrograms of folic acid. But long before that, we began putting folic acid to four. Corn doesn't have folic acid in it, right? We put it in there and we began realizing that babies weren't born with neural tube defects. Gee, just a little folate. We never figured out why. Antifungal corn, fungus. They still don't know this. This is a big secret. I have to dig in, and, and people have been eloquent. These doctors writing in these journals, they're deep, much deeper than I can go, but nobody said corn and wheat and rice have, my, have fungus that make mycotoxins. There are certain mycotoxins that induce neural tube defects in children and anencephaly, brain problems in children. And if we put a little bit more folic acid in, we're okay. We'll do a show on that one day if you'd like also. And finally, in a symbiotic relationship, you see human cells and fungal cells are symbionts. They get along okay. Fungi become the dominant partners. So says Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landecker. I'll see you guys. Thanks. And then this, I want to teach you. And I just need... Each can metabolize nutrients without oxygen. Oh, it's a tiny lump. Any guy in the shower will say, eh, 
but a woman will run to a doctor immediately, and that's probably a good thing. Six months later, the guy's, ooh, got an apricot pit going there. Six months later, oh, got a golf ball going there. It's hard to put my arm down. I'm going to go to a doctor. That lump has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger without any oxygen. Cancer tumors and fungal ascomycetes, sac fungi, reproduce. This makes more cancer cells. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm not certain that's the time to put a needle in it. Just saying, always work with your doctor. Each generates a caustic, a caustic substance called lactic acid. Each depends on their host for sustenance, proliferation, and reproduction. We ain't feeding them, they're both dying. Each thrive in the presence of sugar and die in the absence of sugar. Each emit volatile organic compounds that dogs can sniff. Dogs can sniff fungus. Dogs can sniff cancer. How do we know what it is? How does your doctor know? Both respond to antifungal medicines. Not one brilliant scientist has looked and said, you've got to be kidding me. Amphotericin B, Nystatin, Lamisil, Sporinox, these drugs, there's very few antifungal drugs compared to other drugs. These all have helped cancer patients, yet nobody, shh. You learned in your four-year boot camp to not ask those questions. You learned to send them out to an oncologist and start chemotherapy. Okay? <clears throat> in this book, one of my very favorite books, I might be, I might be buried with this book, uh, I can't even read the title of it anymore, but a Clinical and Immunologic Aspects. <laughs> Here, John, look at this book. You think I've read that enough times? 1957, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Dr. David Weekly's medical textbook. He paid, in here, he paid $6.75 for it. In this book, on page 11, this book is about fungus. Pulmonary coccidioideomycosis is suggestive of malignant uh, cancer, of uh, metastatic malignancy. A fungus? Page 115, localized skin cutaneous blastomycosis is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. Did you know that? Were you told that? It was published, a book that was mandated at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore 70 years ago. I don't want to tell you too much. Um, if I had squamous cell carcinoma, I'd ask the doctor to rule out fungus first. Hey, doc, can I put a little oregano or clove? Can I use a little? It, it, it is so amazing how many people are selling these essential oils, if you guys only knew. Powerhouse, the spice rack the foods in a store. Page 153 in this book. Disseminated, that means it's gotten into the bloodstream and now it's all over. Histoplasmosis. Bird droppings? Mm-hmm. Histoplasmosis. Histoplasma capsulatum. Doug, where have I heard that before? 30 minutes ago I opened. Bat, pigeon poop. Disseminated. Once you breathe it in, poof, it's moved by the blood throughout your body. Disseminated histoplasmosis is, now this is Johns Hopkins, you know, you can see the Meerschaum pipe, and the doctor's all talking, is found to coexist with leukemia, lymphosarcoma, sarcoidosis, and Hodgkin's disease. Hodgkin's disease, much more frequently than is statistically justifiable based on coincidence. That means when we see leukemia and sarcoidosis and Hodgkin's disease, it could be disseminated. Did you raise a parakeet? Grandma and Grandpa have a parakeet? Did you ever have homing pigeons? Did you sweep out under your home? Mom used to go out and say, oh, the, the pigeon poop out there is horrible. Go out and sweep it up. And you did. Were you exposed to histoplasma capsulatum, which induces a disease called disseminated histoplasmosis? 
it's found to coexist much more frequently than coincidence with cancer and sarcoidosis. This book, 1957, there isn't one doctor in America today that knows this, but now you do. Finally, and it's why I love this, you can't find another copy of this, I've looked. Oh, I think Kyle found one and bought it. Um, his wife, when David died, his wife said, you kind of beat up his book, um, would you like it? Disseminated cryptococcosis, this is a different kind of fungus, closely simulates neoplasm, closely simulates cancer. Okay, now I'm going to go to your questions. Oh, there's so much. There's so much. Can I just tell you one more thing? Breast cancer awareness, I don't know because of COVID, if they'll have their annual fundraiser. And as you know, I've met them. They're really good people. Um, can I just tell you something about breast cancer? I don't think there's several different kinds of cancer. I think there's one. Doctors, listen to your doctor, because they're wholeheartedly disagree with me. Several years ago, I gave, uh, it was out in uh, Lorraine Rosenthal, John, remember that meeting out in Los Angeles? Every year they had the answer for cancer or something. It was just great. And every year I'd fly to Los Angeles because my kids live there, and I'd go see them, and I gave a lecture. In the... Uh, 2007, 2008, three papers popped up very quickly, and they were from respected medical journals. The first one said that alcohol of any kind increases not only a woman's chance for cancer, but the fatalities associated with that cancer. Here it is. Where'd this come out of? Oh, I wish I could get into this with you today. We'll talk sometime about your cancer Superman gene that fungus alters, mutates. And doctors don't know that yet. What causes breast cancer? This is JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, circa 2004. Use of antibiotics is associated with an increased risk of incident and fatal breast cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, now breast cancer. Antibiotics, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, be careful of antibiotics. They're not going to. Love them, they're not gonna. It's what they were re-socialized into telling patients. Smart people, twice my IQ, but if you learn wrong, you're gonna disseminate that information. Unhealthy gut promotes spread of breast cancer. Disrupting gut bacteria had profound sustained effects, making cancer much more aggressive. Um, how do we disrupt the gut? Antibiotics, the number one way. Breastcancer.org. Compared to women who don't drink at all, women who have three alcoholic drinks per week have a 15% higher risk of breast cancer. Three glasses of wine a week. Just saying, not judging. Don't judge lest ye be judged. Please, at some time, put the booze down. A high carbohydrate and starch diet increases the risk of breast cancer. Hmm. When you think carb, what do you think? Grains, right? Grains are impregnated with fungal mycotoxins. You eat them. They don't know this, folks. They're in medicine. They don't know this. Remember what they learned. What they have found is people who eat a lot of corn and wheat and rice and grains, a lot of carbs, have more breast cancer. I think that's because of fungus. So those three things were all done. Okay, John, look at this. Look at how prepared I was. But now I've got my show written for Tuesday. Good. I'll get on these questions, and I'll try and answer as many as I can for you guys. Oh, what I haven't read, and I promised Kristen I would do this. Oh, these were so touching. Look at all these. These are all our testimonials on people who have had. Sarah, been on Doug's diet for 13 years now. I had breast cancer, and I've had no recurrence at all. I almost never get sick. I feel great. 
so I was going to read you some of those. Look at my desk. Ooh. You're more important than those. The lesson here is this. Um, always think fungus. I don't care if you have chronic hiccups. Always think fungus. I may be wrong, but it's so simple to rule out. Um, sometimes surgery or medications with deadly side effects are used to rule something out. Change your diet for a month or six weeks. The longest, John, I remember that guy who had migraine headaches who gave that testimonial on TV. Ten weeks, he followed my diet, and on the ninth and tenth week, his headaches started, started to go away. And then uh, this was two years after he went to one of my symposiums somewhere and uh, gave his testimonial. But it took him nine weeks, ten weeks. So don't rush it. You've had that health problem for a long time, that weight problem. What makes bread rise? Is it making you rise? Okay, let's get started here. A hit of herbal tea. What do you suggest, asked Flo, what do you suggest for fungal sinus infection? Uh, okay, if I, uh, if I had a sinus infection that weren't, causing headaches or jaw problems or hurting my ears. Um, you know, my doctor knew about it. I would begin rotating. I'd get a couple of nasal sprays. I would get olive leaf extract, 10 bucks. I would get grapefruit seed extract made by Nutribotic, 8 bucks. I'd put them up in my medicine cabinet where I brush my teeth and floss at night. And before I'd go to bed, I'd shoot two or three shots of one in my nose. And I'd wait a few minutes, lay back, let it drain, blow my nose real hard, go to bed. Next night, I'd use the other one, two or three shots. Now, you have to understand, folks, that many times sinus problems and eye problems and ear problems and hair growth problems, just like we just talked about breast cancer, your breasts are here. They're not down here and yet they're finding a gut association with breast cancer. There's almost always a gut association with other problems that go wrong in your body. You gotta fix the gut. The people who have chronic sinus infections sometimes enjoy their alcohol, sometimes like a bowl of ice cream before they go to bed. Sugar feeds fungus, okay? Sugar has been villainized forever, as long as I've been in this field. Yet sugar feeds fungus. It is the villain. So watch your diet. If I had chronic sinus problems, and that's bad, um, I'd use a neti pot probably to clear things up, then squirt in before you go to bed. Um, if it's severe, always sit down with a doctor and let him take a look and make sure it's not something growing up there, a polyp or something else. But thank you, Flo. I hope that helps. Um, probably probiotic as well. Uh, uh, this is Laura on YouTube. Hi there. Uh, I am a nursing mama. Oh, how great. And need the best prebiotic that's safe to take while nursing. Uh, inulin, they say, is the most commonly used prebiotic. Is it safe to take antifungals while nursing? That is a question for your doctor. I don't you know, know what other health problems uh, you may have. I have asked this question of the doctors on TV with the company EFI Essential Formulas. One of my close friends, They're, these people are amazing. It's a family-owned business. They have both uh, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics and Regactive probiotics, glutathione. And they have always answered their prebiotic. They have a, they have a prebiotic, a probiotic, and a postbiotic. It's one of the rare living bacteria. And they have told me, yes, it's safe to take while you're nursing. Having said that, I'm not your doctor. I don't know. I don't know if you've had lactation problems or uh, milk flow problems. So always just pick up the phone, call the nurse at the doctor's office. Hey, I want to go on a prebiotic and a probiotic. A uh, guy recommended Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. Um, are there safe antifungals to take while you're nursing? Guarantee it. When you chew up broccoli, you're chewing up antifungals. When you eat grapefruit, 
So people never think of food. If you take a clove of garlic and put it on your salad, huge antifungal. By the way, I think really, congratulations on being a, a nursing mom. Um, I think that's so good for the baby also. That's why nurses and doulas have always said, and, and doctors, eat well while you're breastfeeding. Little do they know you're eating antibacterial. Remember we talked about this? Phenolic, P-H-E-N-O-L-I-C. Phenolic compounds kill bacteria and kill fungus. They just happen to be in the foods we eat. Not the canned foods, and not the box foods or bagged foods, but the real food we eat. Congratulations, Laura. Hope that helps. Trying to stop psoriasis, says Devanda. Uh, and inflammation, any advice, please? I got started in Texas. Okay. The year was 1986. I wrote a book uh, years before, and somewhere... I got to show you guys this if I can find it. You got to see what I look like in 1982 or whenever I wrote this thing. Do you have my book, John? Here it is, here it is. Let me stand up, go over here. <clears throat> I wrote this book called The Food Sensitivity Diet. It must have been 1982. A doctor read it on a plane. Here, uh, here I was in 19. Can you guys see that? That's me. I bet I had heels on or what do they call those, you know, shoes? There I was in the laboratory. Do I have a ne I have a necktie? Oh my gosh! Was that with Marty? So John, that's when I first came here. It was in 1987. Wow, man, blast from my past. But at any rate, I used to be young. Um, and in this book, I said somewhere I haven't read it for 50, 40 years. In this book, I said. Gut problems are probably linked to skin. And a guy called me and read me the riot act. <laughs> I've been in the middle of controversy my whole career. The guy's name was David Weekly. He was a Johns Hopkins, okay? I lay it on top of this book. That was his medical book. And he said, don't be silly. Uh, you know, gut problems don't cause these. These are skin problems. I'm a dermatologist and so forth. Well, I said, let me, let me prove it to you. And I flew to Texas to meet him. And he was a very nice man. And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I have long days. And I, no, no, no big deal. And uh, we worked a deal where in 1986, I started coming in three or four days a month. I flew in, uh, worked with him at his clinic. He had the, one of the biggest clinics out here at the hospital down the road. And folks, within, uh, within three months, I went into his office after work. I was going to catch a plane and go back to Los Angeles. And he was emoting. And I said, are you okay? He couldn't believe that the psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis patients were doing as well as they were doing. You see, he's the guy that gave him a shot in the hip, steroid, had him stand in a Puva box, and sent him home. And all of a sudden, he was seeing, my gosh, with the changed diet and with antifungals, I can help these people. He made me an offer. He, uh, we had two little boys at the time, infants. And he made me an offer that was good to pack up, leave Los Angeles, and come out here for five years. So we didn't sell our little beach cottage, and we moved out here. And uh, you know how that goes. You're young, you're broke. We end up selling the beach house. <laughs> oh, I bet we got 400000 for that, and it's probably $3 million today. I don't want to hear la, 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 la. Um, but I came out, and he had two other doctors by then. It, it was mind-boggling what they learned, what we all learned about fungus together. But I want to tell you this, Devonda. Every one of his psoriasis patients, this is a, a tough disease. And uh, I see ads all the time for this new pill that can cause devastating side effects. But show more of yourself, you know. So let me tell you what we used and ask your doctor. We used Dif get out in the sun, please, 15 minutes. It's summer now. With as little as you can wear, uh, if you have a balcony in your 
a home, a little place you can be nearly naked, that's best. Get the sun, get the vitamin D on as much of your body as you can. Not too much, maybe 10 minutes on each side. Uh, but the most important thing is, is to change your diet. Stop feeding psoriasis. Psoriasis needs sugar and pasta and bread and wine to thrive. So just follow my diet. As a matter of fact, I think in the woman's book I described all this. Um, and inflammation goes hand in hand with psoriasis. So anti-inflammatories. A doctor would say take, you know, non-steroidal anti take Tylenol, you know. I tell you, nature does a pretty good job with curcumin and resveratrol and, uh, you know, some of the other things I talk about on this show as anti-inflammatories. Supplements? If the doctor would give you medications, it'll hurry it. If he won't give you medications, ask him if it's okay. If you follow Doug's diet and take caprylic acid and vitamin D3 uh, every day. And see if in two weeks that psoriasis, and get a little sun on it, see if in two weeks that isn't doing much, much better. You didn't heal it. More of the same over extended periods of time will help. Now, the patients used to come in and tell me they cheated. I don't like that word. I changed it to challenge. Hey, Doug, I had a, it, people out here in Texas are fanatical about a drink, a soft drink, Dr. Pepper. When we moved out here, I couldn't believe it. I had a guy who had psoriasis who for two months, his psoriasis, you should have seen this guy. He was so proud. He took his shirt off, showed Dr. Weekly his back and me his back and it where his bloody. He had to wear undershirts. Uh, it was now all better. So he said, it's been two months, Doug. You promised me I could have a Dr. Pepper. This is funny. Uh, down the street from the hospital was a 7-Eleven. And people out here don't drink Dr. Pepper. I bet you they shoot it. They drink huge amount of Dr. Pepper. Um, so he said, hey, great. I'm going to run down the store. I'm going to pick one up. You sure you're okay with that? Folks, I always gave that permission if the doctor said it was okay because they're going to learn. Devonda, you're going to learn. If you do this for two weeks and it starts disappearing, you have every right to sit down to a bowl of ice cream and two glasses of white wine because tomorrow you're going to say, darn, I'm going to start over again. So he went 7-Eleven. That was before cell phones. This is back in the 80s. And uh, Dr. Weekly gets a call. <laughs> He's in examining patients. And the nurse, Linda, came out and said, Dr. Weekly, there's somebody on the phone that really needs to speak with you. Doug, he wants to talk to you too. So we looked at each other and we run in his office and we pick up the phone. And it was this uh, Dr. Weekly's patient. And he said, you guys aren't going to believe this. So I went into, I went into a 7-Eleven, bought a Dr. Pepper, and before I paid for it, I popped it open and guzzled it down. Gave the girl a dollar, went out to my truck, and he said, I almost threw up. I went back in and told the woman working there, um, I got a bad Dr. Pepper, and she said, oh no, I'm so sorry. Pull one from the back, those are the new ones we just put in. He said, okay, thank you. You know where I'm going with this, right? You're the brightest audience in the world. He brings a new Dr. Pepper, sits in his truck. Folks, you're from the rectum to the tip of the tongue, right? Um, intestines, intestinal secretory IgA tissue. The tip of the tongue, your taste buds change. He hadn't had a Dr. Pepper for, and he was a slim guy. That always blew me away. He hadn't had a Dr. Pepper for two months, and it tasted horrible. And he told David, uh, Dr. Weekly and I, he was never going to drink another Dr. Pepper in, in his life. We lost track, folks. What we sold there was a volume switch. You can turn your psoriasis, your migraines, your depression, your tummy problems way up, or you can turn them way down. That's what we teach. We didn't have an off-on switch. I can't shut off non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You might be able to. But it's not going to be done in two weeks. And Devonda, uh, uh, Ravonda, I'm sorry. What I want you to know is, in two or three weeks, you're going to be you're going to be pretty happy if there is a fungal basis to that psoriasis. And I think there is to most. That's the good news. But you're going to want to challenge. And when you challenge, just get ready. 
because the next morning you'll wake up swollen and feeling horrible and you'll want Doug Kaufman's cell phone number to call me and tell me, Doug, why didn't you tell me? I feel horrible. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Yeah, Baker's cyst. Okay. Um, do you know what Baker's lung is, Pam? This is Pam. Hi, Doug. Do you know anything about Baker's cyst? I have a swelling in the left knee, front and back. Painful to say the least. I think they call it Baker's for a reason. Baker's lung, uh, you know, is well known. I have a couple of friends who are pulmonary doctors who tell me they've seen patients with Baker's lung. By the way, they work in bakeries. They're making pizza and they're making dough and flour all day. And guess what? They're inhaling yeast all day. And so they end up, <laughs> yeah, good. They end up, um, uh, this stuff starts growing in their lungs and they end up with lumps that look for all intents and purposes like lung cancer. And I'm sure we have laid to rest many of those people who a change in their, you know, I'm so, a baker cyst is named appropriately. It is likely you've gotten into Saccharomyces cerevisiae, baker's brewer's yeast, uh, and it might come from your glass of wine, it might come from bread, it might come from pizza. I'll tell you what I'd do, Pam. I'd ask your doctor for Diflucan, a systemic antifungal that'll go to the knee, maybe for two weeks, 100 milligrams if you're small, a couple hundred milligrams if you're bigger. Um, 200 milligrams a day for a month or for two weeks and the Kaufman diet as though it were a religion for two weeks. Getting out of bed now? How's it going? Whoa, Doug, it's 50% better. More of the same should allow you to be trouble free on that. Okay? Um, hey, Doc. <laughs> hey, Doc. <laughs> hey, Doc. Just tested positive for H. pylori but got too sick from the antibiotic with symptoms of stiff neck and bad headaches. I've heard that. How do you recommend, what do you recommend I do? This is Joanne. I've seen her in here before. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Good to talk to you again or see you. No, hear from you. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria. Um, that can colonize in the gut and grow out of control. Um, and it, as you well know, it is associated with a whole lot of symptoms and Helicobacter pylori can go on to become much more severe if not treated. Like Lyme disease, we throw antibiotics down people, wondering if it's Lyme's. You see Lyme's and fungus I gave a lecture one time to a group of doctors. Remember that, John, out at the uh, American Airlines Center? And uh, the doctors asked me to talk about mycoses, fungal conditions, and it was a Lyme conference. Boy, if you don't think I was controversial. They say you have Lyme's. Do you got a bullseye, right, on your leg? Is it a bullseye, a ring, a ring, a ring, a point? Then it's probably a tick bite. If not, the symptoms of Lyme's and the symptoms of a localized, no, a systemic fungal condition are kind of one and the same. Unfortunately, if it is a fungus, you're feeding it with antibiotics. Same with the Helicobacter pylori. Let me tell you what I would do. Number one, I'd get on a good probiotic. You, and they don't, you know, listen, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, it's the one I have at home. Love Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. O-H-I-R-R-A, or no, it's O-H-H-I-R-A, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. I would then get some broccoli shoots, if you can find them, or just broccoli capsules, and I'd begin take, ask your doctor, look, the antibiotics failed me, they made me worse. All I ask you guys when I make my recommendations, please know I'm not a doctor, and I want to I want to uh, stick to the standards of the social media, YouTube and Facebook and so forth. I don't want to get in trouble on them. Always check with your doctor. But you've got some repair to do with the antibiotics. I think the probiotics would help immensely. And then I believe that broccoli, great antibacterial properties. Uh, and specific, go online, H. pylori, broccoli 
shoots or broccoli. I worked with a couple of people who fell in love with broccoli. It's amazing that we have safe, natural things like that. Vicki asks, can a staph infection be fungal also? The proper question is, could staph infection be confused? Could a bacterial infection be confused for a fungal infection every minute of every day? You see, when you're taught that bacteria starts with a B, so it's bad, you write antibiotics when you graduate from medical school, everybody gets antibiotics all day. If you ever question that, the companies who you're selling their wares begin having a problem with you. I wonder how many doctors have fallen under the category of quacks because they were no longer prescribing medications. Okay? You bet. I think <clears throat> many uh, bacterial infections are confused for fungal infections. I think very few fungal infections are confused for bacteria, so vice versa, it doesn't work. Here's a general rule of thumb, Vicki. If your antibiotic didn't clear up the urinary tract infection, the, the infection in your ear, whatever you're taking it for, within a week, I would ask the doctor if you could try an antifungal approach. Now, there's a few precursors. Do you live in a moldy home? Do you drink alcohol? Have you been on lots of antibiotics? Do you eat pasta, bread, corn on the cob? All of those things expose you to fungal mycotoxins. So you've got to do your part in starving them. But um, I think many, 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 many millions of infections are fungal, and everybody's getting antibiotics. Women know, we men don't know this, but we should. Women know, some women, who take lots of, three rounds of antibiotics to get a vaginal yeast infection. Guys, we do too, we just have different plumbing. So our prostate begins to swell. Gosh, Doug, that's interesting. Because when I was on that antibiotic, I started having prostate problems. Duh, that might mean you have fungal prostatitis. Well documented, very well documented. And of course, documented is rare. If antibiotics are causing all this prostatitis, bingo, lots of men going to urologists who weren't taught in their medical training that fungus is worth a darn. Everything is bacteria. Women don't get a pap smear, in my humble opinion, don't get a pap smear or a mammogram if you're on antibiotics or if you drink a lot. I'd cut off the alcohol for a week and I would ask the doctor if we could make the, the medical exam a week or two later. I think sometimes we see cervical dysplasia, we see cells on the cervix change, or we see things in the breast that might be fungal induced. Fungus, mycotoxins, antibiotics, we read about them. Alcohol, pasta, men, I wouldn't go to a urologist if the night before you had a couple of beers. Just me saying that. I don't go to urologists. But uh, just know that I think having a higher PSA when you drink alcohol goes hand in hand. Seed that, if you will, with antibiotics, boom. So thank you. I, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, staph and fungus can be confused. If you don't get better in a week or two on antibiotics, ask the doctor. Can I read you something? <laughs> My notes, John. Um, okay. This was... Oh, I had so many good papers to read you. Similarity? No. Okay, I, I won't be able to find it. I have... Oh, here it is, of course. 2017, Center for Disease Control. Fungus Awareness Week, August 8th through August, uh, I'm sorry, August 14th through August 18th. Quote, the Center for Disease Control three years ago, fungal diseases like valley fever and candidemia, yeast in your bloodstream, are less common, but they can cause serious illness or even death. Yeah, fungus can kill you. 
Take your average Joe graduating from medical school. Many fungal infections are caused by breathing in very small fungal particles from the environment. I've been saying that 50 years. I'm the biggest quack. You know, if it walks like a dug and it talks like a dug, it's probably a dug. Fungus diseases are not diagnosed right away because their symptoms can be similar to other diseases. Yeah. 50 years from now, everything's going to be fungus and people aren't going to be running from doctor to doctor to doctor all day. I won't be here, so you can't hold me to that. Think fungus if you have symptoms that don't get better with treatment. Again, Vicki, if you've got a bacterial infection that's not getting better, think fungus. This is instructing doctors, not you and I. Why do we have to be the one to go to doctors? Because they're not going to learn this, folks. Think fungus if you have symptoms that don't get better with treatment. Talk to your doctor about the possibility of a fungal infection. Two words, good luck. Good luck. Easy for the Center for Disease Control to say, but doctors, uh, very few of them, folks, and they're, doctors are good people, overworked, I think, but really good people. <laughs> Jim, you're absolutely right, Doug. I love watermelon, but it gives me itis. <laughs> I think it's because it's sugary. I love watermelon. We used to go to a friend's house on 4th of July, lived on a 70-acre ranch, and they had watermelon, and it screamed Doug Kaufman. When I'd arrive on that ranch, they had on ice. We're in Texas. You know, this was different. We were from California. Um, and I'm telling you, when I ate it, I'd get the itchies. Okay? Thanks, Jim. Uh, so, good question. Why are cancer patients strongly discouraged from eating meat and fish by natural practitioners? Quite, I don't eat meat that isn't grass-fed. I don't eat fish that isn't wild caught. I mean caught, not in a tank on a farm in Arkansas. Caught in a stream, right, in a river. Uh, so that's a good question. You'd think natural practitioners would know the difference between wild-caught salmon rich in fatty acids, protein, amino acid, and uh, same with the beef. Um, but not all of them do. I think there's two kinds of meat. One of them, 95% of all meat, injected with a growth hormone that is a mycotoxin that scares me and fed antibiotics, and cattle that, rain, that eat grass all day, and fish that are raised as seedlings, for lack of a better word, and then sold as salmon. Food's getting weird. Can I just deposit a thought on you while you're here? <clears throat> we can't patent a grapefruit. God did it. We can't patent a grapefruit. Yet today I talked about grapefruit seeds. They can't patent that seed. Nutribiotics, a great company. They can't patent that seed. But if I alter a strand of DNA in it, Doug Kaufman could be DKGF, grapefruit. DKGF, a brand new thing. I own it, man. I got a patent on it. Yeah, but you've genetically modified it. Yeah, and now I can own it. Hmm. I'm worried with the proposed new vaccine for COVID because what I've read so far is it's going to alter my DNA. Nobody owns me now. Thinking out loud, that's my problem. My whole family says, Dad, stop thinking. Okay. Um, Good for you. So, uh, Francis, in answer to your question, if I had cancer, I would agree with doctors. Don't eat meat. Stay away from the mercury and fish, you know, from swimming in the waters. Um, and meat is, uh, with, the, with the hormones and antibiotics in it, I agree. Having said that, protein is good for a cancer. Um, zinc, you know, everything antifungal in there. Uh, and the doctors... Because now, folks, with a family practitioner in there, as dermatologists, all we could do is a skin. 
But when I began assisting patients with other diseases, they knew they had to have a family practice doctor in there. Uh, that's when I started the Myers cocktail, and uh, men and women with HIV did quite well on these slow, you know, it took an hour to drop an IV bag, and he built a nice little area where we, I'm telling you, in five years, I rocked that man's world. It, it, he was blown away. It was awesome. And we were helping so many people. I'm very bullish on sometimes bypassing the very acid gut and including nutrition directly into the heart, okay, or via the vein, the venous system. Okay, so Sheila, I'm, I'm big on that. Okay, uh, Doug from Carolyn. I got my mom's doctor to prescribe antifungal for her back rash. She is bedridden and sweats a lot. Doctor couldn't seem to figure out why, so I thought I'd give it a try. Thank you. Okay, there's something I gotta tell you guys about. This is one of my TV advertisers, Aloe. John, does that? This is Aloe Vera. Now, the cool thing about that product is it's not just the Rhine, which many products are. It's not just the gel. It's called, you can go on my website and look it up, Apex Health, Aloe Apex. This is called Nature's Miracle. We worry when people are sweaty and on their backs, bedridden. We worry about decubitus ulcers, right, bed sores. Such an amazing product, inexpensive. Okay, just go to my website and look up. He's Sarge. He was in Vietnam the year before I was. He and his wife are lovely people. They own this company. Um, tell him Doug sent you. Uh, not, not that I get any money for it, but I'd like him to know that um, I sent you over there. Okay, so, uh, Dr. Ka thank you, Carolyn, that's great. Okay, so Pam says, I wanted to take a candida blood test at Quest, I guess Quest Diagnostics, to see if I had any yeast infection. Would I take the antigen or the antibody test? Okay, um, a blood test. Okay, you're talking about anti-antibody testing. Okay, so, when you were exposed to yeast, and we all have been, you made a B cell antibody. You have two types of perfectly round white blood cells, uh, lymphocytes they're called. One is a T cell, your body's second line of defense, and then blocking antibodies, B cells. Uh, B cells make antibodies. Your body gets a yeast or a fungus, it isn't supposed to be there, boom. Your B cells make blocking antibodies, right? So you have the antibodies. What you want to do is get a blood test to see if which antibody it is, G, A, M, E, or D. We, make, we humans make five protective antibodies. They'll test you for IgG, IgM, and IgE, unless it's secretory. If it's vaginal yeast, it'll probably come up IgA. But if this is a bloodstream yeast problem you're worried about, they'll test you for GAM, G-A-M. IgM means brand new infection just past few weeks. If that's what your laboratory results say, bingo. He'll put you on a little nice statin and boom. IgG means you may have been exposed to this pathogen, this yeast, when you were four years old. You've had a lot of time to develop protective antibodies, IgG antibodies. And, uh, and IgA would be secretory antibodies. So um, you have the antibody so you want an antigen test. You want to find out which antigen. These are called anti-antibody tests. Uh, they'll know which to run. If it's candida, if it's tropicalis, if it's orus, there's many kinds of candida. Uh, so they'll know, but you have the antibody. You made the antibody. Your B cells did. Thank you, John. There's more coming. That'll probably Yeah, yeah, wow. I wish we could do one more hour. You guys all mind hang around for one more hour. I'm on the road. After this, I get my good old black truck and I drive uh, five, four and a half hours. Um, Lynn, okay, I had my first thermal imaging done yesterday. She saw a hot area at 4.5. Uh, she said she only likes to see nothing over 1.5. She said the doctor will read it and get back with me on Monday. Doug, if this was your wife being told this, what would you tell her to do? Now I know this could be nothing, but if I can get ahead of this, it would be good. Thank you for all your knowledge and teaching us. Um, so Lynn, let me preface this by telling you. <clears throat> if I had a reason to go in and have a, a mammogram or a thermogram, 
uh, then I'd be concerned. In other words, if, if you felt something and you said, hmm, I don't want to have a mammogram, but I'm going to go pay and have a thermogram done, then keep an eye on that. The cool thing is a radiologist will read this, an MD will read this, and let you know. Um, I, I, when I see things like this, I always think, you just been sitting in the car with a seat belt on you. There may be hot spots there. Um, but thermograms, I really like thermograms. I would take one. Um, if you went just to get it done, I don't think I'd be so frightened, okay? You're looking down the camera right now at a guy who's, I don't know if I have a prostate. Probably at 40, I should have gone to a urologist. Eh. I had a PSA test, I think, when I got life insurance a decade ago or two decades ago. But I don't know. They took a bunch of blood from me. I wouldn't knowingly. Please don't do as I say, okay? Um, you've got to each live your own life. I wouldn't have had this test done. I'm, and my wife doesn't either. Um, we don't have doctors. We'll know if something's wrong. I suspect because you went and had a thermogram done that you suspected something. I carry, I just took a picture of this. I, I sent this to my son today. John, do you have that picture of what I carry in my pocket, that ingot? Okay, if you could put that up, that would be great. Um, years ago, a woman who is very ill came to see Dr. Weekly. <clears throat> we were lucky. We were blessed. Years later, she sent me an ingot to carry in my pocket. I carry it in my pocket all the time, and it's been washed so many times in the washer, it doesn't even look like an ingot anymore. But this is what I tell you, what's written on that ingot. And I have it right here because I just sent it to my son who's a little bit worried. Fear not, for I am with you. This is a good doctor. He'll read it. If everything's, uh, you know, look, I believe that alcohol and antibiotics and grains contribute to breast cancer. So do they, okay? They publish that. So I'd be careful over the weekend. I wouldn't be overly cautious. Um, I, even if a mammogram came back that way, I wouldn't be overly cautious. I think, folks, what are we seeing with COVID? What have they admitted? We are being over-tested, in my humble opinion, over-diagnosed and over-treated. It works well for the business of medicine to over-treat, over-diagnose, and over-medicate cancer or diabetes. And I figured a way many years ago, many years ago, Lynn, I figured a way out of all that. If you don't like what's going on, Doug, then stay away from them. So far, so good. Thank you. Fear not, for I am with you. And I've carried that for years and years after she gave it to me. Um, very special to me. And I gave my sons one of those, and they, they carry them also. Um, so don't fear. Rent tonight, you want to get that 4.5 down to a 3.5? Rent a Laurel and Hardy movie tonight. Laugh. Rent, go, pick up the old Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I used to love the old Saturday Night Live when I was younger. Rent one of those. Go online and, you know, laugh. I'm convinced we can laugh ourselves out of many illnesses. Um, Doug, it's all political. Natalie, I've seen Natalie. Doug, it's all political. There'll be a miraculous cure after the November <laughs> election. Uh, Doug, I have a friend just started having seizures. Is there any natural product for this? Thanks. Appreciate anything you could recommend. Oh, thank you, John. I see that. Um, anything you could recommend. So petite or petit mal or grand mal seizures. I've seen them. Rough. What could go awry up here? What electrical current could be running through up here? Folks, um, there are neurotoxins that I would almost bet you, Aurora, are in this girl, or was it a girl? I have a friend, that are in this person's diet. Alcohol happens to be one of them. You don't believe me? Sit down with a six-pack tonight, see how you feel an hour later. 
they're neurotoxic, right? And they're quite harmful. Antibiotics are neurotoxic, penicillin and the like. Um, if I was having seizures, of course, I'd go see a neurologist, get anything, uh, you know, there could be a, a tumor or something in the brain. Uh, but if that was clear, I would then change my diet. I would begin. So the FDA, if I'm not incorrect, and I may be here, cleared CBD. What was the company we had on TV? We really liked them, John. Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web is a philanthropic uh, website, uh, and they give CBD. They give no, they don't. They sell it for half price or something to parents who have children with epilepsy, with seizures. Wow, it's amazing. What they don't know is some of these cannabinoids in CBD are antifungal. Makes sense, it's a plant. What they also don't know is diet may be feeding her seizures. So uh, think Kaufman diet, give that a try. John, do you have that graphic of mycotoxin-containing properties? Look at this, folks. Mycotoxin properties, they can be mutagenic. They change your genetic material. These are made by fungi that you're inhaling, eating. We now know antibiotics are mycotoxins, right? They can be tremorigenic. What is Parkinson's disease? They can be carcinogenic. They can be genotoxic. They alter your DNA. Teratogenic, they will mess with your embryo. Neurotoxic, nephro is kidney, hepato, uh, liver. They can be hemotoxic to your blood, cardiotoxic, your lymph system, your skin, immunosuppressive, they'll lower your immunity, or they can be endocrine disruptors. Doug, why am I having this parathyroid problem? My doctor tells me it's my thyroid. Um, look, Doug, I'm 280 pounds. My doctor tells me, say, what disrupted your little girl thyroid? I'm telling you, it can be corn. It can really be corn. Endocrine disruptors, the biggest one is from fumonisin mold. Not uncommon. Fumonisin's one of the big ones. It makes a poison called xerelinone. You see, we synthesize that mycotoxin and inject it in all cows. Only in North America, Canada and North America. European Union said, we're not buying your meat anymore. We're worried about xerelinone in it. FDA says it's okay. I want you to know that. Um, okay, good. Oh, you're in Canton. Okay, good. Uh, this Kim, my brother's 33, went to the doctor because he has a sore, a swollen sore in his left breast. Okay. You know, that could be nothing, but I love the idea of getting to a doctor. Male breast cancer is 1% of all breast cancers diagnosed now. Doctor says it's a mass. He's sending him to get a mammogram and a sonogram. We need a doctor for a second opinion for natural uh, protocol because what if this is a fungus? Um, yeah, I'll send you information. I'll be in my truck for the next four hours. Okay, so um, good. I'll take care of this. Not tonight. I don't land till later, but I'll do this over the weekend. Um, can I just tell you, Kim, I really like a local doctor here. His name is John Ganino, G-O-N-I-N-O. -N -N He's a friend of mine. We eat breakfast and have fun together. Um, I'd call the Gonino Wellness Center, G-O-N-I-N-O, and have him just set up a consult with Dr. Ganino. He can palpate the mass. If, this, if he or your other doctor feels this is fungus, Dr. Ganino would know uh, what to do for it. Uh, Anna Marie says, I've seen her in here a few times, thank you for your referral to Dr. David Wong. I went to see the, him the other day and he is doing fungal testing on me. Can you talk about the antifungal effects of black seed oil as Dr. Roby mentioned? Dr. Roby, this guy is, I love this guy, Roby Mitchell. Roby Mitchell taught police jujitsu and karate. He was a Marine long, he's younger than me, so he's a Marine. And the guy is just built amazingly. Roby and I have been friends for some 20 years. Uh, 
yeah, Roby has, I think, one of the better black seed oils on the market. Would it shock anybody that black seed oil is potently antifungal? I love it. Thank you for reminding me of another one. Besides yours, Natalie says, could you recommend the top five books uh, for my research? Okay, this is a good question. When I die, you guys all come to Dallas and start picking out these books. There are books here, you just, and in my office, a thousand books on fungi and their mycotoxins. Doug, is a geographic ton related to fungus? Very often it is, Colleen, very often it is. Mycelex, M-Y-C-E-L-E-X, trochies. They're little candies you suck on. Three to five a day is what the doctors used to prescribe. And if this is a thrush, uh, there's something called a black hairy tongue. People literally, it looks like they have hair growing on their tongue. That's often a fungal condition, so Mycelex trochies should be able to help you. God bless you guys. I'm hitting the road, won't land for quite a while tonight. Thank you for being here today. And when we start on Tuesday, I'll honor Natalie. We're going to start with what books that aren't too expensive would I recommend for you to begin studying this? Good for you, Natalie. You're a good student. I'll see you guys next time. God bless. Bye-bye.